Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the program today, we have the banjo. Okay, maybe not banjo music, but we have stories about the banjo. How is that even possible? Trust me, it is. We have two listener stories about paranormal encounters with the instrument. No way. Yes way. And we have an OTR classic called Never Follow a Banjo Act. Cool, man. We end the show with some classic commercials, and it all begins right now with this 5-Minute Mystery. Another 5-Minute Mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by The Details. We all love a detailed story, but when it gets to be too much, it's too much. Or, if you leave stuff out, we get confused and shrug. So let's get to our story and see what details we have today. They could be useful. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Go immediately to Whaleback Beach. Body has been reported found on shore. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Hey, you! What are you doing down there? I'm the one who called the police. The body's down here. I'll be right down. Now, wait there. Take your time. That hill's pretty steep. Uh, Is he dead? I'm afraid so. I've been trying to bring him around. And who is he? A neighbor of mine. John Rawlings. Uh, what's your name? Uh, William Sanders. I live uh, up the beach about a mile. Rawlings has the cottage next to mine. Uh, what's happened here? Well, I just come in with my boat when I saw Rawlings sprawled on the sand. From the looks of him, he must have been in the water for several hours, as he had several strings of weed clinging to his wet clothes. I've been working on him while waiting for you. Uh, and he's gone, all right. Uh, poor Rawlings. I don't quite know how to break it to his wife. Uh, Mr. Sanders, um... Where did you say you had been this afternoon? You mean when I discovered the body? Well, uh, before that. Well, I was out sailing all afternoon. I usually come in about five o'clock each afternoon, but since it was such a warm day, I made it an hour later. You were out all afternoon then? Yes, that's right. This evening, when I was sailing in, making for my anchor boy, I noticed what seemed to be a body lying on the beach. I anchored the ship and rowed in with my little boat that I keep tied up to the boy. Uh, Where do you keep the rowboat when you're on shore? Oh, I also keep it out there. This line here, attached to the cliff, goes out to the boy, and... After I row in, I use the line to pull the rowboat back out to the water. That's to keep the tides from smashing it on the rocks. You say you rowed right into the beach? Yes. Rawlings was lying high up on the sand. He must have been washed in by the high tide and left there when it ran out. How far out do you keep your sailboat? Well, when it's high tide, it's about 100 yards offshore. And at low tide? I should say about 50. When I came into shore tonight, it was only necessary for me to row in that distance as it had been low tide for about four hours. Well, that'll be sufficient, Mr. Sanders. I have enough for my report. It's been a horrible accident. No, Mr. Sanders, you mean murder. What? I repeat, murder. And I'm holding you as the killer. What flaw did the policeman discover in William Sanders' story that brands him as the murderer? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... There's a lot of detailed questioning that ends with an accusation of murder. Everything sounded good to me, but I'm guessing they left out some key detail that just might help us understand this one. You see, my problem is I'm left wondering why, how, and when. (laughs) But hey, that's just me. This mystery is being brought to you by The Details, which we both lack and have in abundance. And now, back to our story. Uh, Mr. Sanders, your story contained one glaring contradiction that turned it into a confession of guilt. You told me that the body was wet when you found it. Yet just a moment ago, you admitted that the tide had been out for about four hours. 
thus leaving the body lying on the beach for that length of time in the summer sun. If Rowling's body were wet, as you claimed you found it, it's because you just put it there after first drowning your victim. Sorry, Mr. Sanders, but your story sailed off course that time. Your alibi is on the rocks. One glaring problem, Mr. Policeman. How can you prove that he was the one that dragged the body up? Oh, and what was his motive again? We have so many details in this case, but they left out the most important one. Why? This five-minute mystery was brought to you by... The Details. Is that you said? I wanted to take a minute and tell you about next week's podcast. It's going to be a very different show that I have decided to call Past, Present, and Future. What we'll have is something from the past, something from the here and right now, and finally, we will talk about the future of the podcast, and I have a surprised guest or two. You won't want to miss this episode, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. I will tell you more about it in next Tuesday's blog, and of course, the show will debut as normal on Thursday. I can't wait to share it with you and hear your feedback. I received this email from Danny Neal, who didn't say where he hails from. Hey Ron, I've decided to start my own podcast and can't seem to get it going. I'm a longtime listener of your show and was wondering if you can help me. I want to do a show, but I can't seem to find a topic that hasn't been done to death or would be of any interest to anyone living or dead for that matter. What do you suggest, Danny? Danny, Danny, Danny. One thing that I have learned over the years is nobody can do you. What that means is, is that you have to figure out what you're passionate about and go with it. At first, you're probably going to struggle, but if you keep with it, one day it'll all click and whiz bang boom, you're a podcaster. Here's my suggestion. Write down the topics that you care about. Then research each one to find out what other podcasters are doing with these subjects. This should give you some ideas of what you want to do or maybe not do. In the end, I guarantee you will hear yourself say, I'm sure I can do a better job than that guy. Then set out to do just that. If I can help you out, offer advice, even give you tips, I'd be happy to do it. Good luck on whatever you choose. Some of you have noted that Blueberry was not updating the podcast correctly, and they were either several weeks behind or didn't have some shows at all. Unfortunately, I have no control over what they do as that I'm not one of their clients. My podcast is hosted with Lipson. I did contact them and told them about the issue. I checked a few days ago and it does seem to be updating properly now. Thank you to all of you that let me know. And now, here is a message from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Sherlock Holmes, The Voice of Treason an audible original drama written by George Mann and Kevin Scott. This is a brand new Sherlock Holmes adventure created by Audible and only available through them. There is a plot to kidnap Queen Victoria and only Sherlock Holmes can stop it. Or can he? 
Investigating a crime seemingly unconnected to the royal family, Holmes and Watson uncover a conspiracy to kidnap Queen Victoria and destabilize the British Empire. With a ticking clock to her next public engagement, Holmes and Watson must discover who is behind the plot and locate Her Majesty while Mycroft keeps the monarch's disappearance a secret from the British people. Now, here's a sample of what you can expect from this riveting book. Baker Street was never the same without Holmes, and these last few nights he'd been most conspicuous by his absence. Obsessed with his latest case to the exclusion of all else, it seemed he had gone to ground, throwing himself hook, line and sinker into whatever cesspool he was investigating. As far as the world was concerned, Sherlock Holmes was overseas. Only Mrs. Hudson and I knew the truth. Despite my reservations, I had been forced to go along with this foolhardy scheme on the single proviso that he should send word once per day by note or by messenger of his continued safety. It was now drawing close to eight o'clock in the evening on this, the third day of his absence, and as yet, I had received nothing whatsoever. Here we are, Doctor. I thought a fresh pot of tea might be in order. Mrs. Hudson, you are forever a delight. My thanks to you. I, um, I don't suppose... What I mean to say is I presume you've had no word. From Mr. Holmes? Not a peep. But then if I had a penny for every time he'd gone off like this before, I'd be dining out at the Ritz, morning, noon and night. Good point, Mrs. Hudson. He's not known for his fastidiousness when it comes to sending word of his adventures, is he? I dare say I'd have fewer grey hairs upon my head if he was. But I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd wager neither would you. It's just... he does tend to go charging headlong into things. Especially where that damnable professor is concerned. I'm such a darned fool for letting him go without making proper provisions for his safe return. That's why you're good for him, see? You're the only one he's got. The only one in this world who cares enough to look out for him when he's up to his usual nonsense. If I'm such a good friend to him, Mrs Hudson, why the devil does he shut me out in this way? We both know what he's like, Doctor. This is his way of keeping you safe. Now drink your tea. Perhaps a visit to the club tonight would do you well. I think not. I'll give him another hour. If there's still no word, I'll have no choice but to go after him. He, he might be in trouble. I think you can be assured of that, Doctor. By my reckoning, Mr Holmes is always in trouble. As you can hear, this is not another reading narrative. This is a full audio drama complete with sound effects and great acting. It stars Nicholas Bolton as Sherlock Holmes and Kovna Holbrook-Smith as Dr. John Watson. It is eight hours of plot twists and turns to keep you listening to the very end. You can have Sherlock Holmes, the voice of treason, today. Here is what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you too can have Sherlock Holmes, The Voice of Treason. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we are going to feature the banjo. 
Our first story was sent in by Mike Collins from Nashville, Tennessee. This story reminds us that perhaps items that convey emotion have a life of their own. Mike has titled his story, The Jealous Banjo. Hello, Ron. I wanted to tell you a story about my banjo, or rather, a banjo I had at one point. I'm a musician, and I was on tour with a somewhat famous group playing banjo for them. We were on our way out of the city, and we were heading to another. It was the practice that everyone loaded up their own instruments under the bus. However, this trip, I had some extra things to do, and I asked a friend to load my stuff. He said that he would take care of it. Later that day, we all boarded the bus and went on to the next city, which was some 250 miles away. When we arrived and unpacked, it was quickly discovered that my banjo had not made the trip with us. We called back to the previous bar, and they said that they saw no sign of it, but they would keep an eye out. This was a problem. What does a banjo player do when he has no banjo? Answer, scream, worry, and hope there's a solution. The leader was a kindly sort, and he said since it was our roadie's fault, we will find you a banjo. So it was that we went from guitar shop to guitar shop, and not a single one of them had a banjo for sale. We were about to give up when we saw that there was one more shop left in town. It was a hole-in-the-wall place, appropriately named Last Chance Guitar. It was pretty clear that this place was a last stop for everything string-related, but they did have banjos. I was saved. Surely one of these would do. So I grabbed the first banjo and played it. All musicians will tell you that when you find the instrument you're looking for, you'll know it's right, and this one was not it. I tried two more with the same result. Too stiff, too loose, too hard to tune, too old. The owner said he had only one left and brought it out from the back room. Just came in, he said. I played it and fell in love. The band leader quickly shelled out the dough, and we were out the door with a banjo in hand. We played several gigs after that, and each time I played that banjo, I fell more in love with it, and it was a good thing. We came to the end of the tour, and I was regretting it, because I knew I was going to have to give it back. I also received word that they had found my original banjo, and I had them mail it to my home address. I went to the band leader and told him how much I enjoyed playing with them, and he told me that he would have me back in a minute. I then handed him the banjo and said thank you for the use, and he told me to keep it as a parting gift, with his compliments. After a bit of discussion, I agreed to take the banjo if he agreed to have me back again, which he did, by the way. I had been on the road for several weeks, and it was good to be home. My wife and kids greeted me at the door with many hugs and kisses. Later that evening, my wife told me some bad news. My old banjo had arrived, but it was in bad shape. The headstock was broken, the strings were gone, and its head was torn. I just laughed, but she didn't understand why. I went out to the van and brought in my new banjo and told her the whole story. For the next few weeks, I was at home. I played only a few gigs here and there, and it was strange. Each time I played, it was as if my banjo had changed. It didn't feel right, and it bothered me. One night, after a particularly bad performance, I was angry and frustrated, and I threw the banjo case across the room. It landed with a thud, and the banjo fell out onto the floor. I just left it there and went to bed. I woke up to screaming. My little girls were screaming. I ran to their room and found them in the corner hugging each other. They were crying, and they said the bad man with the banjo scared them. At first I didn't know what to think. 
we calmed them down and learned that a man had come into the room carrying my banjo and said some pretty scary things. I went to my banjo and it was still there on the floor. But when I picked it up, it was warm to the touch. Hot, in fact. I put it back in the case and as I did, I felt a cold breeze wash over me. I turned, and I swear I saw an angry old man, and he was screaming, but I heard no sound. I quickly closed the case and took the thing outside. The old man vanished. The next day I took both my banjos and traded them in on a brand new one. I've not had a problem since, and all of my performances, for the most part, were fine. I have no explanation for this. The only thing I can think of is that my instrument got jealous because I wasn't playing it every night like I did when I was on tour. Mike Collins, Nashville, Tennessee. Hmm, a jealous banjo. And a scary one at that. I can safely say that I've not heard a story like this one before quite the tale, and I thank you, Mike, for sharing it with us. I've heard of haunted items, but this one is terrifying, to say the least. Have you ever heard the saying, never follow a banjo act? No? Well, that's what we're looking at today. I have another banjo story for you. It's amazing to me when this type of thing happens. Call it kismet, destiny, or just coincidence. But in one week, we have two listener stories about the banjo. This one comes from Dina Thorne from somewhere in New Hampshire. She has titled it, My Banjo is Haunted. Hello, Ron. I heard you asking for a ghost story, and while this might not qualify, here's mine. So, my mortgage was paid off and there was a bit left from the endowment fund, so I bought a short neck tenor banjo. I have played the mandolin for a few good years, so it was dead easy to pick up and get started playing tunes straight away. But there's a problem. You see, this banjo was haunted. Whenever I played it, I could hear a man with a deep voice talking in the next room. Even if no one was there, even if there wasn't a next room. When I stopped playing, he stopped talking. I just had to tell someone, so I went to my girlfriend and told her the story. She was excited and wanted to hear this phenomenon. I had never tried this with another person around, so I went and got it. As soon as I began to play, that voice began, and my friend let out a gasp. She heard the voice as well and ran around the house looking for the source. We tested this a few times and the more I played, the louder the voice became. Finally, she reached out and put her hands on the strings and exclaimed, I can understand what he's saying. While I can't repeat exactly what it said, in a nutshell, he was repeating, Get your dang hands off my banjo. I sold the banjo the next day and bought a zither, which is basically a German banjo. It is a bit tougher to play, but at least it doesn't talk back. Dina Thorne, New Hampshire. Well, Dina, two banjo stories in one week is crazy. Thank you for your story. It is creepy and unusually odd. I might have kept the banjo just to tick the guy off, but then again, your solution was probably the smarter course. Now, if you think we're done with banjo stories this week, hang on to your zither, because our next story is amazing. Our featured story for this week comes from the classic radio series, Suspense. This is a strange little story that I just had to share with you. 
Growing up, I remember hearing the incredibly powerful voice of Ethel Merman. She could belt out tunes like nobody else. However, few knew that she could act as well. She won Tonys, Golden Globes, and Grammys during her career, but sadly, nothing for this performance on Suspense. The story is about the shady side of nightclubbing and stars the singer as a gal hired to keep an up-and-coming crooner on the straight and narrow. It is titled Never Follow a Banjo Act and first aired on February 1st, 1954. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Miss Ethel Merman in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a good-humored lady with a big voice and a soft-spoken boy with a very sharp knife. The story is called Never Follow a Banjo Act. Our star, the queen of musical comedy, Miss Ethel Merman. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Never Follow a Banjo Act, starring Miss Ethel Merman, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. You're a hero, a Nero Apollo, the Wizard of Oz. You've a kingdom, power and glory, the old, old, oldest of stories is new, true. You've built your own. In just one day Life is mystic A midsummer's night We live in a Turkish delight You're in heaven It's swell when you're really in love It's swell When you're Ladies and gentlemen, Rosie Jones. Come on, take one more bow, Rosie. Yeah. Hey, uh, oh, man. She really does come on, that girl. Well, ladies and gentlemen, oh, you lovely uptown types. You came, you saw, and you heard. The one and only, the immortal Rosie Jones. Ride of 52nd Street in the Club Nightshade. Hey, sing well and golly, baby. And now we bring you Chico and his Mambo Rascals. Get it, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Sing melancholy, baby. Hey, no, doll, no. No what? Don't unhook. You got company coming back. Listen, Benny, if I've told you once, I've told you a million yeah, times... Yeah, but this that... is different, doll. Oh, this is different. Yeah, it's always different. Come on, come on, fix your hair. May I come in? It's open. I can't stop you. My name is Cram, Rosie. Ray Cram. I'd like to talk to you. Ray Cram, huh? Beat it, mister. I don't think you got the name right, or maybe you never heard of me. Every guy who wants to make a big impression back here claims he either is or is representing a big agent. Doll, this is Ray Cram. I assure you, Miss Jones, this is Mr. Cram. And who, my dear, are you? I'm Johnson, assistant to Mr. Cram. Tell you what, Mr. Cram, show me your driver's license. Oh. There you are. Oh, have a chair. Call me Ray. You know, I've been an admirer of yours for many years, Rosie. Many, many years. You can skip the many years stuff. I guess we all know how long I've been around. Sorry, Rosie. Well, for some time, I've been casting about in my mind, speculating as to how your mature talents could best be utilized. Benny. Listen to Mr. Cram, doll. Benny, if this is a rib, so help me, I'll kill you. Go on, Mr. Cram. Well, last night, it came to me. I know. You want me to replace Marilyn Monroe. Rosie, you're a sensitive, insecure girl because somehow these last few years have passed you by. But I want you to shut up and listen. All right. But so help me, if this is a rib... Shut up. You know I'm representing Terry Dane. And you know who he is and you know what I got. Right? And no cracks. Right? Right, right, right. 
The hottest thing since Frankie was first discovered. That's it. We've had new ones and new ones. They come, they go. But this Terry Dane's a million dollars a year gross. With tousled hair. Face you'd like to put in your lap and hug and kiss. And a voice like... Well, the answer to a maiden's prayer. Personally, I go for men. But what's the pitch? She goes for men. Great little kidder, huh? <laughs> Listen, Rosie, ask me what's the pitch, I'll tell you. We're opening, Terry, at the new cactus retreat in Vegas, two weeks from Saturday. He gets 25 G's a week. I read it in Billboard. Big deal. We need somebody to work with him, Rosie. Somebody who's got the experience and the talent and a voice you could lay bricks on. Somebody who can really go along with him. It is a rib. Will you shut up? So may my mother be struck dead if I should say one word that isn't the truth and sincere from the heart. Go on. Benny's paying you two seventy-five, Rosie. I want to buy your contract from him. I'll give you an even grand legitimate expenses plus transportation. You like? To work with Terry Dane. Four weeks guaranteed, maybe a bonus. Who knows? Benny. I seen the contract, Rosie. And, um, you? I assure you, Miss Jones. I'll give you the... ten seconds to give me a firm answer. Say yes, we finalize it here and now. Uh, you don't mind if I seem a bit in the dark. That's nine seconds. What happened to that big My Darling Died campaign your office was spreading? When you had him singing, uh, I'll Never Smile Again and so forth over the cute little girl who was killed in that accident. Constance Green? Boy got over it. So why don't you get him another young thing, like she was? Never follow a banjo act with a banjo act, Rosie. Old show business motto. Gee, she was cute. And that accident, what was it? She fell through a shower door or something, bled to death. Five seconds. Four, three, two. I'll take it. That's my girl, Rosie. Now, while you're signing these, gentlemen, if you just leave us alone for a minute. Sure though. thing, Mr. Crane. Now, the pen just, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Standard form, no riders? No riders, Rosie. But there's one thing I want to make clear right from the outset, so there's no misunderstandings later. Why, Mr. Cram? No, serious, dear. About Terry. Keep away from him. Okay. I mean, away, dear. He's a moody kid, terribly shy. Remember what I said before about liking men? Yeah, and that's what I call being mature. He's just a boy. You got no interest, you'll develop none, you'll keep clear, clean, and away. Is that right? Right. Oh, um, I'll make it look good on stage, Ray, but after hours... Uh, after hours, I'm going hunting for one of those uh, Nevada cowpokes. <laughs> Terry Dane. <laughs> Me and Terry Dane. It was a good arrangement, Terry. Go on. They're cueing your solo. Uh, who cares about solos? I like duets. I like doing it with you, honey. You're a passionate one, you are. So get on with you and passionize that mob, Terry. They're calling for an encore, sugar. An encore of you, my boy. Of you. They like you. Love you. Every last dame in the place. So get out there. Yes. They love me. It's true. Every last one of them out there. Everybody seems to. I don't intend to try to explain it. It's just a thing that happens to women when I sing. That's right. That's right. Now sing for them. That's the boy. But it, it, somehow it, it just doesn't seem to happen to you, Rosie. Now, why would that be? Why would that be? Lady wages two bits on the 23 red. Rosie? Hello, Ray. Get me a two-bit plunger. After your turn in the last show. Yeah? Gary was whispering to you. What about? Oh, he wants me to join his fan club. Something I don't know. And what else? Nothing else. You sure? Hey, look, what is this anyway? Nothing there. Keep up the good work. And keep on keeping away from Terry. That's right, dear. A pleasure. Bye now. Toodaloo. Uh, Miss Jones, ma'am? Why, hello, Texas. 
Oh, my name ain't Texas, ma'am. It's Earl. Earl White. Earl. But that's such a short name for such a long man. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you how much I liked your singing, Miss Jones. Really? Oh, you're not just saying that. Oh, no, ma'am. You're one in a million, Earl. Yes, I'm... Blurt it out, Earl. Well, I'd sincerely like to buy you a drink, Miss Jones. Well, let's saddle up, Pod, and get with it. You know, it's a right smart stretch since I've seen the sunrise, Earl. Finest time of the day, Miss Rosie. And look at those mountains, all purpley and gold. Yeah, a man could look at those mountains for quite a spell. Here's my bungalow, Earl, so I guess I'll be saying good night. Or is it good morning? Don't rightly know which to say, ma'am. Let's uh, just make it so long till later. We still got that riding date? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. So long, partner. Bye. <laughs> Who's there? Who's that in my bedroom? Hey, Dream Boy. What do you think you're doing in my bungalow? Dream Boy, Terry. Oh, come on, Terry. Time to go home to your Betty Bye. Gotta look good tonight, Pally. Yes, indeedy. So come on. Stand up. And... Hey, you're gonna cut yourself playing with that butcher knife. Put it away. You're like Connie. Connie? You're like Connie. And like that other one when I was little. Connie? Oh, you mean Constance Green, that little girl who used to sing with you. The one who died? Connie was like you. Oh, we're not in the least... Connie a... didn't like me. Yeah, don't, don't snap that so close to me. Don't. Oh, Connie didn't like me. You don't like me. Everybody likes you, Terry. You don't. Yes, I do. I do. Why? Because when you sing, when you sing, it, it does something to me way inside. Does it? Yeah, it makes a lump in my throat, and I, I just want to swoon. You don't mean it. I do. I do. I, I've never heard anything like you, Terry, and your hair. Oh, I love your hair. I just want to, to, to tousle it. Do that. Do what? What you said. Huh? Well, don't you remember? Oh, that knife. It's, it's making me nervous. You don't like me. You do what I said. Oh, oh, oh. Put down the knife and I will. All right. Like this? Yes. Do you like to do that? Oh, oh, yes. I, I love to tousle your hair, Terry. You do? Yes, you do, don't you? I can tell. Yes, Terry. I bet you'd like to kiss my eyes now, Connie. Oh, yes. Yes. Towels all your hair and kiss your eyes. Yes. But I won't let you. It's time I went back to my bungalow. Oh. All right, honey, if you insist. When I saw you lying there, all in blood, I knew you finally loved me and it was right. And it was right. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, um, I'll see you tonight, darling. It's mean making you wait. Yes. 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 Autolite is bringing you Miss Ethel Merman in Never Follow a Banjo Act. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hi, Harlow. Well, hello, Bob. Hey, got new Plymouth, eh? Yes, sir, and what a car. 
Just like they say, under the beauty, there's solid value. Say, uh, you know, we're saluting Plymouth tonight on suspense as a distinguished member of the Autolite family. Plymouth's a distinguished member of my family, too, Harlow. The kids love its looks, my wife loves the comfort, and I really go for the economy. And we all go for a drive every time we can. Because with Plymouth, driving is the real pleasure it should be. Yeah, and hey, talking about drives, you get a choice of three, don't you, Bob? Yes, you do, Harlow. Synchro silent, or if you wish, automatic overdrive, or no shift high drive. They're all available on this great new Plymouth. And of course, you know, Harlow, four is auto light equipped. I sure do, Bob. You're justly proud of your new Plymouth, and auto light is also proud of its long association with Plymouth and Plymouth dealers everywhere. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ethel Merman in Elliot Lewis's production of Never Follow a Banjo Act, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Good morning, Miss Jones. Well, let me in. How's that? It's, it's me, Ray. Come out here. I've got to see you. Well, what are you doing up this time of day, dear? It's a problem, Rosie. It's your boy, your client, your tousle-headed million-dollar gross. <laughs> Terry? Yeah. Now, what's the rascal up to this morning? Murder. Very funny. Now, come on, Rosie. What's going on? You mean you don't know? Oh, no, no what? No jokes, Rosie. Now, what's this about Terry. In words of one syllable, Ray, that boy is a nut. He was in my bedroom just now with a knife, this long, suggesting that I should maybe flip every time he opens his mouth. I tell you, he scared the living daylights out of me. This is serious. You bet it is. He darn near cut my throat. And all because he said I didn't like him. Didn't like him? Yeah. And you know what you said about the old show business motto, never follow a banjo act with a banjo act? Yeah. Well, Ray Cram, you've done it. He's got me all mixed up with her and something about lying in a pool of blood and... Oh, this isn't for a baby. To that boy, I'm another banjo act. Well, well. What should we do? Call the police. Let them handle it. We can't very well do that, can we? Why not? The kid's sick. He's insane. He could do anything. Aren't you exaggerating a bit? No. Think now, dear. Don't you think it might have been just a little joke, huh? Ray, nobody makes jokes like that. Sure they do. Don't they, Johnson? Yes, Mr. Cram. Uh, quite often. So, why don't we... Forget about this, huh, Rosie? Forget about it? Yeah, forget about it. Hey, now. You're getting a grand a week, dear. Top publicity, a swell time, so why don't you relax, hmm? I'll have a little talk with Terry. There'll be no more jokes, I promise. Okay? You know. Know what? The kid's maybe a little loopy. You know. You know about him and that little knife of his. Don't raise your voice. And maybe you know how that other girl, that Connie, died. She fell through a shower door. I read about it. She was cut up pretty bad, wasn't she? Johnson. Uh, Yes, Mr. Cram. Give me a drink. Yes, Mr. Cram. You want a drink, Rosie? At six o'clock in the morning? What I want is a good explanation. And after that, I want to use your phone. Now listen, Rosie, and listen good. You've been around a long time, dear, and you know what can sometimes happen to a Weisenheimer who goes popping off when it's uncalled for. But this is called for. That kid belongs in an asylum or someplace. That kid represents a million-dollar gross. Of which you get 10%. Of which I get a whole lot less than that. He's divided up a half a dozen ways, Rosie. Some of the holders are very influential parties. One of the parties in particular wouldn't like it if anything happened to make the money stop coming in. That party's name's a secret. But I'm going to tell it to you, Rosie, because you've been around and you'll appreciate this. Who? The syndicate. So explain. They're human beings, sort of. Tell them the truth. Tell them they bought in on something bad, just like you. You don't understand. I sold them their piece. Me, Ray Cram. You're in trouble. Not unless you talk, and if you do, you're in trouble, too. Here's your drink, Mr. Cram. Ah, you put ice in it. I'm sorry, Mr. Cram. Ice it hurts my caps. So sorry, Mr. Cram. Go on, fix it. Uh, Yes, Mr. Cram. How do you mean, I'll be in trouble, too? The syndicate. I'd be forced to tell them who blew the whistle on their golden goose. And then, well, you know. 
Oh. So, take the realistic view, huh, dear? We'll protect you. We'll keep Terry away from you. You've got nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? Now I'm real reassured. Look, Ray, couldn't I just uh, slip out of town? No. I saw the boys after the show. They liked you. You stay. That's the word from the boys. You know, this is kind of a hysterical situation. Hell you are, Mr. Graham. Caps. They cost me 3500 All they do is ache. I wish I were dead. And, uh, dear. Yes, dear? You're singing good on your solo, but don't sing too good on your duet. Don't take away from the boy. No, no. That's it, dear. Bye now. at me, I heard a melody, it haunted me from the start, something inside of me started a symphony, sing with the strings of my heart, t'was like a breath of spring, I heard a robin sing about a nest set apart, all nature seemed to be in perfect harmony, sing with the strings of my your eyes made sky seem blue again What else could I do again But keep repeating through again I love you Love you I still recall the thrill I guess I always will I hoped we'll never depart Dear, with your lips to mine A rhapsody divine Zing went the strings of my heart Never could carry a tune, never knew where to start. You came along when everything was wrong and put a song in my heart. Dear, when you smiled at me, I heard a melody, something inside of me. Sing with the strings of my heart Just like a breath of spring I heard a robin sing All nature seemed to be in perfect harmony Sing with the strings of my heart Your eyes made skies seem blue again What else could I do again But keep repeating Again, I love you, love you. I still recall the thrill. I guess I always will. I hoped we'll never depart. Dear, with your lips to mine, a rhapsody divine. Sing when the For ladies and gentlemen, Terry Dane. Hello, baby. Hi, folks. Isn't she great? Isn't he great? Terry? Yeah, doll? What are you thinking about, Terry? All things. What kind of things, Terry? Moon, June, spoon, uh, tune. Got a tune? Oh, I got a tune. Good little tune? Happy little tune. Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I like a happy little tune. Is there a boy in it? No, just a girl. Uh, What kind of a girl? A very quiet girl. And she was right. Right and dead And red as red can be. Oh, what are you going to sing, Terry? She was red. It was all red. 
Get hold of yourself. Why are they whispering? Sing. Don't they like me? Sing. I'll make them like me. Make you like me, Connie. And now that we've done our little crazy bit, folks, we're going to carry on in the... Look out! He's got a knife! Hey, watch out! Ah! You can't close me up! Not out of your heart! Connie, close me up! Hold him! Hold him! Rosie, get out there, sing something. Oh, I'm dead, I'm ruined. Yeah, I've got his arm. Keep holding him! There's no business like show business, like no business I know. Yes, sir, but it's all right, folks. Just one of those little things. And so, let's go on with the show. Uh, Consign, if I can figure what makes a fella like that tick. I think I'll play the black tonight. He went just plum loco, didn't he? Took six men to get him into that there special airplane. <laughs> I swan, flying a man to the bug house. Too many banjos. That's all, partner. Too many banjos. I beg your pardon, ma'am, but I don't rightly follow you. Let it pass, handsome. Let it pass. Next week, a true story. The report of two murders and the heroic man responsible for these necessary atrocities. It's called Death at Scrankerood Pond. Our star, Mr. Jeff Chandler. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Never Follow a Banjo Act was written for suspense by James Poe. The duo pianists were Walter Gross and Vic Piamonti. In tonight's story, Shepard Mankin was heard as Terry with Joseph Kearns as Cram. Featured in the cast were Jerry Hausner, Ben Wright, Paul Fries, and Jess Kirkpatrick. This is the CBS Radio Network. Nifty story and I hope that you enjoyed the musical interludes. Suspense was known for making these types of show that fit their guest star's persona. This was an original story written by James Poe, who was a regular contributor to Suspense. Ethel Merman, born Ethel Agnes Zimmerman, was an actress, artist, and singer. Known primarily for her distinctive, powerful voice and leading roles in musical theater. She has been called the undisputed first lady of the musical comedy stage. Among the many standards introduced by Merman on Broadway were I've Got Rhythm, Everything's Coming Up Roses, and of course, There's No Business Like Show Business, which became her signature song. How about that? It's time now for Old Time Radio Commercials, brought to you by Claddy's Goodies. Good treats for your dog to eat. Now, I'm pretty sure that you'll remember this first one. Well, at least I remember this one. My dog's faster than your dog. My dog's bigger than yours. My dog's better because he gets kennel ration. My dog's better than yours. Kennel ration. The lean red meat he wants, the other good things he needs. Juicy, tender, and moist. My dog's prettier, smarter, taller. My dog's better than yours. Kennel ration. I've got a question for you. When do you think Velveeta was invented? If you said in the 50s, you'd be wrong. Velveeta cheese first hit the market in 1918. 
It was created by Emil Fry of the Monroe Cheese Company in Monroe, New York. The product was advertised as a nutritious health food. How about that? Now, in November, come the longer evenings when folks drop in to play bridge or stop for a snack after the movies. So keep the refrigerator stocked with Kraft's famous cheese food, Velveeta, to spread or slice for swell toasted sandwiches. Velveeta's a natural for late evening snacks, you know, because it's digestible as milk itself. These days, you really ought to be buying rich golden Velveeta in the two-pound size, so you'll have plenty for snacks and also to melt for economical meatless main dishes. Remember, smooth-melting Velveeta helps supply the protein you expect from a main dish, but the price is low. Tomorrow, get Kraft's famous Velveeta. Okay, this next one is very near and dear to my heart. I have always loved my good and plenties. The candy was first produced by the Quaker City Confectionery Company in Philadelphia in 1893. And it is the oldest branded candy in the United States. Choo Choo Charlie, the engineer who filled his train with good and plenty, first appeared in advertisements in 1950. Once upon a time there was an engineer. Choo Choo Charlie was his name we hear. He had an engine and he sure had fun. He used good and plenty candy to make his train run. Charlie says... Our last one comes from Budweiser. This one features the Crew Cuts. They were a Canadian vocal quartet that made a number of popular records that charted in the United States and worldwide. They named themselves after the then popular Crew Cut Haircut. Budweiser commercial featuring the Crew Cut. Where there's life. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little trip into the past. Who doesn't love an old-time radio commercial? episode number 438 of 438 and we have these people to thank Danny Neal, Mike Collins, Dina Thorne, Gladys Goodies and of course Audible. Thank you to you all. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that should fit every need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Pressing that like button helps us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.